Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to uh, today's uh, webinar entitled Empowering Engagement on Unveiling of the First uh, National Cancer Communication Strategy. My name is Lilian Genga, working with National Cancer Control Program. I'm a program officer. I'll be your moderator this evening. I have my panelists. I'll, uh, I'll introduce them according to uh, the way they will do the presentation. The first presenter would be Dr. Bor, Dr. Uh, Joan Paula Bor Malenya, Head of National Cancer Control Program. Then we'll have Celia Kadambi, Development Communication Specialist, uh, uh, working with ECA Communications. Then we have Dr. Jay Frida Chepchumba, Program Officer at National Cancer Control Program. Dr. David Murage, Program Officer, National Cancer Control Program. And Communication Officer of National Cancer Control Program, Elaine Wigai. Uh, so I would want to welcome our first presenter, Dr. Bor. Welcome, Dr. Bor. If you're in a position to share your screen, please go ahead. Dr. Bor, are you able to hear me? Nelson? Apologies, uh, we had a bit of a technical challenge. So they are joining back now and we'll be able to start. Apologies for that. So, okay. So uh, as we wait for the panelists to join, uh, this is just to let you know that uh, we National Cancer Control Program developed a, com a national communi uh, cancer communication strategy, which we are uh, uh, now doing dissemination, and this is our first dissemination. And um, I hope you'll uh, uh, have a good listening and uh, uh, note your questions. If there is a pl uh, any place or anything you'd want to inquire, uh, you are welcome to do that at the end of the uh, the webinar. So I think my panelists have joined. I introduced them when they were away. I can do the reintroduction again. Uh, uh, my first presenter is Dr. Bor. Malenya, Head of National Cancer Control Program. Then we'll have second presenter, uh, Celia Kadambi, Development Communication Specialist from ECA Communications. Uh, then my third presenter is Dr. Joy Frida Chepchumba, Program Officer, National Cancer Control Program. Then we have Dr. David Murage, a program officer from National Cancer Control Program, and Elaine Wigai, communication office officer from National Cancer Control Program. So just as I explained, I would uh, want to usher in the first presenter, uh, Dr. Uh, JP Bor, uh, to share the screen and go ahead, do the presentation. Yes, that is Dr. Murage. You can allow him to be a panelist. Go ahead, um, Dr. Bor. Thank and you. Share your Good speech. evening. Good evening, everybody. And thank you for joining us today. Um, just about to share my screen. Um, 
just a second. And um, thank you. If this is your first time joining our webinars um, as uh, the National Cancer Control Program, Haribu Sana, you're most welcome. I know I'm eating into my time, which I will try to stick with. Um, but uh, I think I was a bit disoriented when we had a bit of a technical challenge. So sorry for that. But I'm just uh, sharing my screen. And uh, we'll be good to start just now. So welcome, everybody. Um, this is, uh, I'm going to do an introduction to the cancer communication strategy. And um, this is how the book looks. Uh, um, and as you can see, uh, the strategy is running from 2023 to 2027. And I will through a background and context, look at the policy framework and give majorly an overview of the National Cancer Control Strategy. Uh, on which this strategy is, is um, you know, anchored. And then we will look at the National Cancer Communication Strategy. I'll just unpack it for you a little bit and uh, tell you about the process we went through to develop it. Uh, noting uh, now that uh, cancer is one of four major um, NCDs, non-communicable diseases, which account for more than 60% of the annual global mortality. That is the reality um, that we have uh, with cancer. Um, and uh, we have more than 10 million deaths annually as a result of cancer. Over 75% uh, of these are in low and middle income countries, which means that we are uh, disproportionately affected by cancer in low and middle income countries such as our own. And also um, it is projected that the cancers would continue to rise over the next two decades um, and unless we do something about it. So we must do something. The cancer is the third leading cause of death in Kenya after infectious and cardiovascular disease. The burden is, is projected to rise to 58,000 new cases in 2028 and over 95,000 cases by 2040, if we don't do something about it. I'll tell you more about the challenges a bit later. And uh, looking at our cancer burden, this is our data um, for Global Can uh, 2022. This is the latest data that we are using model from our registries. The top three cancers, as you can see, are breast, cervix and prostate, followed by esophagus and colorectal cancer. We have over 44,000 deaths every year as a result of cancer. And then uh, new cases in terms of deaths, over 29,000. You can see now that uh, cervix becomes the leading cause of cancer deaths, overtakes breast cancer. Uh, and breast is second, esophagus is third, colon, and prostate following that order. So you can notice that. Um, you probably, if you know how the cow uh, it has been in the past, this is a rising trend because we had 27,000 cases in 2020 and deaths, and uh, now we have 20, over 29,000 deaths. When we look at our policy frameworks, we as a country don't exist in isolation, so we are aligned and committed to the global obligations, which are three main ones around cancer. The first one is the Global Cervical Cancer Initiative 2020, which seeks to eliminate cervical cancer as a, as a public health problem by 2030. By meeting these targets, the 1970-90 targets by 2030, this will put us on a path to elimination. Uh, I think if you are not very informed about these targets, you'll be sure to join another webinar that will be focusing on cervical cancer. And then. Uh, we are also aligned to the Global Breast Cancer Initiative 2020, whose goal is to avert 2.5 million deaths globally by 2040. And this one also is uh, anchored around three pillars, healthy promotion for, I mean, health promotion for early detection, whereby we're looking at uh, diagnosis 60% of breast cancers 
in stage one or stage two. And then looking at timely diagnosis, that means within 60 days of first contact with the health system, one should have a diagnosis. Then we have the comprehensive breast cancer management, whereby 80% of those diagnosed with breast cancer need to attend treatment and undergo at least 80% of the full courses of their different kinds of treatment and go home successfully. The other important one we have is the Global Initiative for Childhood Cancer, which seeks to increase survival rate for children in low and middle income countries such as our own, where we are at 20%. To 60 percent and re reduce suffering and therefore save one million more children uh, through this initiative. We have our own robust uh, policy framework in Kenya anchored uh, around the uh, Kenya cancer policy uh, and I'll be telling you a bit more also about the um, cancer com cancer, our, our uh, National Cancer Control Strategy, which is our five-year strategy, and these are the other policy documents that we have. This is the one that I want to focus on a little bit, the National Cancer Control Strategy 2023 to 2027, whose goal is to reduce immature mortality from cancer in Kenya by a third uh, by the year 2028. And also note that the vision of this strategy is a nation free of the preventable burden of cancer. So this means that we are working heavily towards prevention, hence the importance of this communication strategy that we launched recently in January. This strategy is, is, uh, is centered on five pillars. The first one is prevention and early detection. The second one is imaging pathology and lab medicine. So basically diagnosis. The third one is on treatment, palliative care and survivorship. The fourth one is on advocacy. Uh, partnership, coordination, and financing. And this is where the communication strategy specifically fits. And the fifth one is a cross-cutting pillar, which is strategic information registration and research. I'll just tell us the overarching goal of each of these pillars. Uh, for the first pillar, it's about providing quality and equitable prevention and early detection services so that we reduce the preventable burden of cancer. Pillar two seeks to provide accurate, efficient, accessible and timely diagnosis through imaging and lab uh, medicine for best, better patient outcomes, pillar three. Pillar three is all about ensuring timely initiation of comprehensive treatment, strengthening access to quality and sustainable care and improving the quality of life for cancer patients. Uh, when we come to pillar four, I know I'm rushing, but just uh, bear with me. This is just an introduction, so you'll get more uh, as we go along. Pillar four is on uh, forging and supporting effective advocacy and communication partnerships and mobilizing resources for robust cancer control in Kenya. While pillar five is all about implementing a comprehensive and sustainable MND uh, uh, surveillance, registration, research, and knowledge management, so that all this to inform policy and practice. So a quick run through the National Cancer Con Communication Strategy, the process we went through to develop this, it was it involved a lot of stakeholder engagement and uh, input from diverse groups, including patient groups. We started uh, in the when we were implementing the previous cancer control strategy. This is where the idea was defined that we need a cancer communication strategy. We began planning. In 2019, there was a spotlight on cancer uh, when we lost some uh, prominent uh, personalities in our country due to cancer. And um, of course, it was in our plan to form a cancer uh, ACSM TWG, which is advocacy, communication, and social mobilization. We formed that to engage experts. In, and in 2018-19, we had a first draft. In 2021, we finalized the draft through the expert engagement we did in the planning phase. And in 2023, we, you know, our, our, our draft was near final, but it was not quite actionable. And we brought on uh, a, a consultant uh, to assist the team. Uh, and I'm happy that the consultant uh, will be unpacking for us this strategy in a bit more detail. Uh, within this webinar, we did a validation with internal and external stakeholders. We launched it. 
We are now on the path of disseminating it and rolling it out and monitoring and evaluating. So as an overview, this strategy uh, is the first national cancer communication strategy. It has five chapters, which will be unpacked in this uh, webinar. Uh, and the overarching goal is to provide a well-coordinated and sustainable national cancer communications framework that will enhance public awareness in cancer prevention and control. All these uh, in order to reduce uh, incidence, morbidity and mortality and improve the quality of life of cancer patients in Kenya. Uh, in context, there's a lot of misinformation and inaccurate information, and this will be unpacked more in the situation analysis, so allow me not to go through this, but one key thing is that we lack unified national brand or campaign, which is part of what we are seeking to achieve through this strategy. Uh, the rationale for having this uh, strategy is uh, it was based on evidence. There were some studies done and it was uh, clear that many Kenyans thought that there's need to raise public awareness and improve cancer uh, information and education. The access to credible and reliable health information plays a crucial role in influencing individual behavior and decision making. And uh, we saw that having this strategy will provide an overarching guide for implementing communications plans to support the cancer control strategy that we are currently implementing. This strategy is for all of us. It's for health and non-health actors, including the general public, uh, cancer patients and survivors, healthcare professionals, policy makers, government agencies, national and county, civil society advocacy groups, uh, community leaders and so on. And it is based on these principles of inclusivity and equity evidence-based approach, collaborative engagement, culturally appropriate communication and empowerment and behavior change. So in conclusion, uh, is that the cancer burden is rising in our country. We are lacking credible sources of information. Hence, we need a more streamlined and consolidated effort. Yes, we have a robust policy. We have a robust uh, plans and legal framework with the National Cancer Control Strategy being our roadmap for the next five years. And this communication strategy will provide an effective communication framework for unified and harmonized national cancer awareness campaign if we implement it as we should. So my question to you and my call to action is what is your role as a key stakeholder? Allow me to acknowledge all uh, that I included on this slide, and I may have missed some, uh, but that's the end of my presentation, and I hand it back to you, Lillian. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Bor, for a good presentation. Uh, now we'll move to our second presenter, uh, Dr. Uh, Joyfrida Chepchumba who is going to take us through situation analysis. Welcome, Dr. J. Frida. Hi, good evening. I hope you can all get me. All right, so Dr. Bora has taken us through the introduction of the cancer control uh, communication strategy. Uh, so chapter two is on the situation analysis. Uh, so, how is the communication landscape in Kenya? Generally, um, the uh, communication landscape in, of cancer uh, circulates mostly around the Ministry of Health, the general public, the counties, uh, development partners. So there are various stakeholders, various channels and approaches, and all this will uh, be on cancer prevention, cancer diagnosis, or cancer treatment. So as part of communication, we heavily rely on cancer awareness days. And uh, what I'm projecting on the screen are the various um, uh, months in the year. And you'll notice for each of them, there are some type of cancers that are celebrate that are um, that we try to create awareness, except for August and December, uh, which uh, don't have anything commemorated. On a national level, we have six main uh, days that we commemorate. Uh, in January, we have the cervical cancer 
Awareness Month. This runs throughout the whole January and we even include an advocacy training for key stakeholders and opinion leaders in the country. Uh, in February uh, 4th, we have the World Cancer Day. Then February 15th, we have the International Childhood Cancer Day. Uh, the first Sunday of June, we celebrate the Cancer Survivors uh, Month. And in the whole of September, we actually have another Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. This just shows how crucial childhood cancer is. And in October, I think we're all aware we have the breast cancer awareness. So the importance of these days, uh, it gives us a chance to create awareness and to just speak more about these types of cancer. So like in March, you will see we'll circulate some messages on colorectal cancer, multiple myeloma, in uh, currently we are in May, so May we'll have some uh, brain cancer, bladder cancer, melanoma and skin cancer uh, uh, messages that will be circulating. So uh, in the recent past, we've done some form of uh, communication. Uh, in 2019, we had a breast cancer uh, health awareness campaign in Nyeri County, just to do a pilot. What do people know about breast cancer? How many have been screened? And would they be up to um, receive these screening services? 80% of the respondents recalled seeing or hearing of the breast cancer campaign in the month of October. And 75% said that, that they had actually heard of this through the community health promoters. So that also shows you how important these people are. 68% mentioned that they had had it through church announcements and WhatsApp groups. So you can see the channels, the channels that people are getting this information. Now, a survey was done on cervical cancer uptake, uh, uh, the cervical cancer screening uptake. 68% of eligible women were aware that they need to undertake the cervical cancer screening. However, only 16% had actually undergone screening. Another study uh, in men, 64% of men interviewed felt they were at a, at a risk for developing uh, prostate cancer. However, only 2% were screened uh, for prostate cancer. In terms of cancer knowledge, a study by Shaheen et al. on breast cancer knowledge and perceptions in rural uh, Kenya found that Less than 10% of adult women and men knew two factors that influence breast cancer. So the research noted that very low levels of knowledge about cancer uh, was also among the, the population and clinicians. So even as clinicians, we noticed that there were really low levels of knowledge about cancer. And then generally, there's just a poor health-seeking behavior among the Kenyan people. I think we will all agree on that. And this is actually a significant barrier to cancer screening, early detection, and even effective treatment, which all reduce cancer morbidity and mortality. So uh, generally, these were the pointers that came out uh, from qualitative uh, studies, that these are the barriers to cancer treatment and testing in Kenya. First, there's the high cost of testing and treatment. Then there's the low level of knowledge about cancer among the population and clinicians. And since we're speaking to clinicians, I think that that is also a big call to action. Do we know? Do we know about cancer? Are we able to speak to our patients about the need to, to do um, annual checkups? When you see a, a woman is coming for uh, family planning, do you tell her to also get uh, screened for breast cancer? Do you screen her for cervical cancer? Then we have the poor uh, health-seeking behaviors among the population. Most people, if they're not sick, they don't see the need of going to hospital. And yet we know, especially for cancer, if you're feeling sick, it's already advanced. So we need uh, to change this um, uh, notion that you, you only go to hospital when you're sick. Then there's the long distances to access diagnostic and treatment uh, services, uh, lack of decentralized diagnostic and treatment facilities. I know we've really... Um, improved in this sector. The ministry has really opened up so many uh, treatment facilities. We have three referral cancer centers. We have uh, 12 uh, county uh, uh, treatment centers for cancer. So there's, there's been a lot of improvement in this sector. Uh, then there's uh, the poor communication and of course the lack of uh, cancer policy uh, development and implementation. So the key 
findings from all these studies were that there's significant gaps in public awareness and knowledge and health-seeking behaviors and sustainable access to cancer health information. So this communication strategy aims to provide a comprehensive roadmap to execute communication activities based on evidence-based and context-appropriate strategies for cancer prevention and control. So when you're communicating uh, cancer information, what should you um, focus on? First of all, it's important to use credible channels. Depending on who is passing this information, you'll be able to be more persuasive as opposed to using a different person. So the channels of cancer information in Kenya, you can have face-to-face -face interpersonal communication channels. And this is um, definitely more effective. People are able to ask questions, they're able to see the person who's speaking and they even just relate better. They feel like, hmm, I can, I can really relate to this person who's passing this information. Then we, we have the normal traditional and digital mass media, our radios, our televisions, and on this, uh, you remember the Niri study that we talked about? There was something very important that came out. This pilot was conducted uh, and the communication was passed through the radio channels using the vernacular language. And that really, really worked. So we, we noticed uh, as Kenyans, we still really enjoy being spoken to in our vernacular language. And that really needs to come out. If you want to see more people taking up your... Uh, your information, you really need to speak to them using the language that they most relate to. Then you can also have group discussions, focus groups, and community gatherings. It's important to also note that patients will seek health information both from health workers as well as herbalists. So even when you're having these conversations, even in the community, ensure you also bring in the traditional healers so that um, they can all hear the message uh, from the health worker. So this is a very key message. There is need to critically evaluate information as we read it to reduce the likelihood of taking in inaccurate information or help people become more discerning in their sharing behavior. So this is something we also need to tell our patients. Not everything you read out there uh, is true. You need to really evaluate the information that we read even before you circulate it. So uh, the communication we are doing here is about cancer. So what do we know about cancer? What causes cancer? And it's uh, been known that the exact cause is not known, but 40% of cancer can be prevented by avoiding certain risk factors. So a risk factor just makes you to be more likely to get the cancer. Uh, then we have the genetic factors, which contribute 5 to 10% of, of cancers. In uh, 2015, there's a step survey on, on NCDs, which, uh, whose findings were 28% of Kenyans are overweight and obese, and 94 do not consume adequate fruits and vegetables. 13% reported to use tobacco, uh, while alcohol use was at 19%. It's important to note all those that I've mentioned have been listed as the risk factors for cancer. Poor diet, alcohol, tobacco, lack of physical activity, obesity, diabetes, and environmental risk factors. So which are these social determinants of health that will affect health-seeking behavior? Social economic uh, status. Uh, there's a notion, and I'll call it a notion, that people who are more empowered economically will actually seek uh, health services. But this has also been a bit um, uh, skewed because you've seen like the HPV uh, vaccination uptick. You'd expect Nairobi being a, a county that, uh, you know, we have more people being economically empowered that they would uh, take the services uh, very well. But unfortunately, Nairobi is one of the lower counties in terms of coverage. So what is really happening? Why are these economic empowered uh, populations not taking up some of these uh, health-seeking uh, services? Cultural and sociocultural norms. This one we've seen uh, cutting across. There are some uh, um, cultures that will will forbid even a woman going to, 
to see a doctor. And if you go, you have to be accompanied by a male person or you can't see a male doctor. You know, there's so many barriers that, uh, that come through. How about the social support? Does this person have a social support? If you want to go for screening and uh, you have no one to leave your child with, or you know your husband forbids you and tells you where are you going, you know such support um, really affects. Or even if it's a mother who wants to take this girl child to receive the vaccination, but the father says there's nowhere this girl is going. So as much as the mother wants to to give the girl the vaccination, the father refuses. So such support health. Uh, literacy, um, geographical location and access to healthcare uh, services, discrimination and social exclusion. Are we offering these services to everyone? Yeah. Are we discriminating people maybe based on maybe their health status, maybe the HIV positive? Five, Are five they minutes left. Five minutes. Yes, I'm almost done. Then what are the health policies and systems that we have? Okay, so uh, these are some of the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats that we noted are in our system as, as this strategy was being uh, uh, developed. We have a national cancer control strategy. Uh, we have a health promotion directorate. We have trained uh, cancer champions. We, we generally have a good political goodwill. Some of the weaknesses in our system include lack of a well-structured mechanism, for sustained awareness creation. Then there's the weak capacity of cancer stakeholders on communication. And of course, there's some language barriers at community level when disseminating information. And as Dr. Bork mentioned, there's lack of a unified national brand or campaign. Some of the opportunities we can leverage on, there's the multi-sectoral collaboration that is there in the health sector and also beyond the health sector in the different ministries. The cancer awareness days that I mentioned, we can leverage on those. Um, some of the threats that we may need to consider is the high levels of cancer stigma, the cultural sex, the, so the social uh, practices and beliefs such as with witchcraft. And this really affects, because there's a lot of myths and misconceptions, there's media sensationalization on cancer issues and inaccurate reporting. Those are some of the threats that will affect um, this communication strategy. So in summary, effective communication is key in cancer control. Studies have highlighted uh, large um, gaps in knowledge and in action. Some know, but only uh, a handful of people uh, take up these services. It's good to know that 40% of cancers can be prevented through behavior change, uh, stopping alcohol, stopping smoking, healthy diet, uh, keeping uh, your weight at a good level. Then there are different channels of communication depending on the audience. And these need to use credible channels and sources. You as a doctor, you are a more credible source to give this cancer information than anyone else there on the street. These people who are telling people, come, we'll, we'll scan you on the, I don't know, some machines will tell you if you have cancer, no. You as the doctor, when you have the five minutes with your patient, you are a more credible channel and this need to critique the information that is out there. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. J. Frida, for a good presentation. I will move to our next presenter uh, on the communication strategy itself. We have part A and part B and our first presenter is um, on audience and messaging by Celia. Uh, Pete, Celia, go ahead and present your screen. Dr. J. Frida, you can stop sharing your screen. Uh, thank you. I think Elaine is presenting for us both. I'll do the first bit. Elaine, Elaine, you are doing the first. 
on yes so i'm going to take through the the goal objectives target audience and messaging um yes uh, here we are chapter three so thank you very much uh my name is celia kadambi i i was actually part of the team of consultants that led into the designing of this strategy. I'm very excited that we're at the implementation stage. So I'll try and I think I have 25 minutes uh, to take you through the first four. So we can go to the next slide, Elaine. So the theoretical framework, this one I'll just touch on because it has a lot to do with what the previous spoke, speaker spoke about, which is around social determinants of health, because primarily the strategy is around behavior change. How do we change behaviors of the public and push one unified message, just like Dr. Bor said. So social change is a process. There is the part where there's little or no knowledge, then that goes to awareness, which is the biggest headache we have now. How do we make this our how do we make the public aware, our target audience? We need to identify who are the people we are talking to, what are we telling them, what is it that they need to know? Um, then after they know what they need to know, how do they adapt that behavior and take action? And eventually there's a demand and social reinforcement by the audience. Next. So it's a lot about what uh, the social determinant of health for behavior change. So factors that influence behavior change. And why is this important? Because this determines how we are going to coin our message, which is very, very key in uh, any behavior change communication dissemination. So there's a knowledge and awareness. How much do our audience know? Uh, what is the message and the source? Like my previous speaker said, is it credible? And then another one that is very important, and we are going to talk about this in the theories, uh, the presentation has gone, is uh, how does this self-efficacy, self how does this affect me as an individual? Um, and do I feel threatened by the condition? Only then is when people are able to uh, act on whatever messaging it is that they receive. So around the theoretical framework that the cancer uh, strategy was designed was so social cognitive theory and the health belief system. I believe uh, the health belief model. Uh, the presentation has gone, but I'll try and continue. So the social cognitive focuses on the interactions between individuals, their behavior and their environment. That's the word social. Uh, what do they, how do they behave based on how they observe others, their self-efficacy and uh, receiving social support. If you look at the cancer strategy intimately, uh, there's a proposal of using cancer champions who serve as role models for healthy living to combat cancer. This is very key uh, when it comes to how do we ensure that the message that is being sent, one is from a credible source. So we are saying we're using a champion who's saying I've had this condition or I've gone through breast cancer, I've been able to uh, receive this kind of treatment and now I've been able to fight. That is how you're able, people are able to see and relate by observing other people. Then there's a health belief model. The health belief model is influenced by uh, perceived susceptibility to a health condition. If an individual asks herself, can I really get it? I've been involved in various campaigns and one of the struggles I have, at least I say for cancer, now it is very prevalent. And I know the susceptibility is very high. Uh, people know, you mentioned obesity, smoking. Uh, there are many factors that can uh, that can determine whether you get cancer or not. So we are already a step ahead on this. People feel that uh, it's not very far-fetched. There are other campaigns, I'll give an example, say polio, which we are trying to uh, eradicate, or epilepsy, which is one of the campaigns that I do. People feel it's very far removed, so they're highly unlikely to respond to your message. The other thing they ask themselves in this model is how bad is this disease if I get it? If they feel it's not so bad, sorry to give this example, now COVID, for example, people are saying, Sasa, you're too. if nothing happened to you before, nothing will happen to you right now. So those are the kind of things you study and find out the mind of the person and how is it you're going to change that mindset. The other is how can I prevent it? And how much will it cost me? Will, it, will I have any pain or will it you know, make me feel uncomfortable in any way uh, so that they can respond to this. So based on this, um, messaging is very, very key. 
Um, I usually uh, tell people in communication, especially the part where Dr. Bor said, unified messaging. And at this point, maybe it's just to bring up on top of your heads, I don't know if people are able to put in the chat box. When you think of successful uh, campaigns around health, for example, which ones do you feel that have, a, have had an impact in society? I'll go first at international level. I know you've heard of this movement called the Me Too movement. Why has it been so impactful? Who was it targeting? What was it saying? Uh, we have another one that comes to mind is Black Lives Matter. I think also uh, the slide is still not showing. I'm just continuing, but if you can be able to present it, I'm seeing on the chat, uh, people are asking for the slide. Elaine? Apologies, Celia. Elaine had a network issue, but uh, I'll be sharing okay. your slides shortly. Just keep going. I just keep going. Yeah. Okay, so as I go, just to engage the audience, I would like proposal of uh, campaigns that come to your head. That's at international level. At uh, regional, or let me come closer home, the most recent was commercial corona. I don't know if you guys remember commercial corona. Um, what other campaign comes to mind at a national level that you feel has been successful in terms of messaging, consistency, and behavior change? Anybody? I know we started well with HIV and AIDS awareness. We've done a lot around malaria. Any campaign that comes to mind? Other than commercial corona? I see one in the chat. Yeah. To control. 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 Yes, that was that was for Millicent to quite control of your life. That was around HIV. I remember at the beginning we had Jijue, uh, because at the at the start of HIV and AIDS awareness, I know what just like cancer, we were trying to meet at the point of screening. And then if you remember that matured to a channel nampangwa kind of kick out polio of Kenya. Fantastic. Uh thank you, Gerald. Another one. At a national level, that you feel had impact, commercial TB, exactly. Yes, I remember the TB one. Uh, commercial TB, malaria. Was there anything around malaria? TB in a tiba. Actually, that's the one I remember, and I remember it was. Is there something you realize about the consistency of these campaigns? They're very precise. They're very relatable to the public. Uh, and they're actually in one words or two words in a very simple language communicating what it is that they want to achieve. Pata chanjo ka chonjo. Fantastic. So like uh, my previous speakers have said, cancer, uh, if you do agree with me where we are right now, we don't have a unified campaign. Nimechil, yes, for the teenagers. That was specifically for teenagers. Neti kwa watoto na wajawazito. Fantastic, for malaria. Donate blood, it's safe and it saves. Why do you think these campaigns are important? Why have you heard of them at a national level? It has a lot to do with stakeholders coming together. It has a lot to do with research on the ground and finding out who are we talking to? What is it that we want to tell them? How do we want them to change their behavior? For cancer is multi-layered. When we look at our target audience, which is the key, the Two key things for this strategy, I would stress, is the message and the audience. Who are we telling what and how do we want them? What do we want them to respond as a result of our, our message? Mbu inje sisi ndani. I've never heard of that. But okay, speed kills malaria. Sisi ndani mbu inje. Oh, that must have really been effective in... So we'll do a bit of audio. I don't know if the slide has come, but if you'd allow me in the interest of time, yes, there. Yeah, thank you so much. Julia, you can see the slide? Yes, now I can see them. You can skip the models. I think I have touched on them. I think, yes, this is the main thing I'm talking about, our audience and key messaging. Why is this important? We are here as different stakeholders. Uh, we interact with... Uh, uh, our patients at different levels. We have women, for example, who are susceptible to breast cancer. There's the men. We have smokers. 
are we giving a different message to each of this audience? Are we giving the same message? Are we giving an overriding message and cascading it to the different audience? Those are the questions. So one of the key things we do when you're developing a strategy is analyze your audience and then curate messaging around those audience. And the audience is always a primary audience and the secondary audience. I do tell people even uh, national TV, for example, Citizen, which is being aired in every corner of the country, they do have their primary audience and their secondary audience. Primary audience means who are those primary people they are targeting and the secondary audience, quote unquote, right. And you will notice every, programmatic area around citizen or KTN or whichever other media house uh, is curated around the primary audience. If you look at what citizen airs, it's slightly different from NTV, it's slightly different from KTN. But people choose different programs to watch, but they are targeting, for example, if it is a mass market for citizen, they are targeting um, your middle and lower LMS, as you'd call them, income. But then it doesn't mean that citizen is not played in Lavington, it is. But you have to have who the primary people you're targeting and design your programming around that. And the secondary audience can still be part of the messaging, but everything you curate around communication has to be a primary and secondary audience. So who is our primary audience? It's a cancer patients. It's our healthcare professionals who are in this platform. Why? Because you're the ones who are the first contact of our patients. The general public is a bit wide, but yes, cancer is, is quite wide and diverse. High population, high risk population, uh, smokers, family history, et cetera, et cetera. And then children, youth and students and vulnerable groups, those in confined areas such as prison, refugees, people with disabilities, et cetera, who are our secondary audience. Next slide. We are talking of the caregivers and the family members we are taking care of our patients. We are talking of our religious leaders in churches who are very influential. We are talking about teachers, our human resource managers in our workplaces because they have, our patients are working in our workplaces. We're talking of the policy makers and government officials. We're talking of the CSOs and CBOs. So when it comes to key messaging, next, for effective cancer messaging, pay attention to cultural factors on health beliefs and behaviors. This was also touched a bit on social determinants of health, but what is very critical here to notice is communication should be very clear, accurate, audience-centered, persuasive, and science-based. When I read all these uh, campaigns that you have mentioned, for example, I've had today Mbu Nje Sisindan. I can bet this was probably uh, targeting, it was more on a national level, maybe targeting at county level where Swahili is what people resonate with. And the message is very clear. So long as I understand the language, it means that the mosquito should be outside <laughs> and the person should be inside. In four letters, you should be able to have communicated what it is that you're trying to say. It should be able to resonate with your audience. It should be able to be persuasive. I remember Nimechil for teenagers and maybe early campus who have been told to uh, we have been told to what not to have sex. I don't know how that works. We started with condom use, then uh chukua control. Ukimu ni hatari. Those were the first ones where communication was still very young and immature, where you almost use threats. But now we try and be, become more our audience has become smarter. Digital media has brought a lot of um what do you call it? Uh high IQ, abstain. Yeah, we started from abstain. Now we realize abstain is a hard sell. We go to condom use, then we promote, we move from there. <laughs> uh, I hear now in HIV and AIDS, people are less concerned about spreading the virus than they are getting pregnant. So what research now should be looking at is how do we go back to where we started? Because if we are not being threatened by uh, the virus, any more pregnancy is more. It means that we did so well, and then our children now have missed the point of prevention, and pregnancy is not threatened. Anyway, communication evolves. So next slide about messaging. That's why I said messaging is very, very key. And the reason I'll keep stressing on this is that we've come up with an umbrella campaign, which united as stakeholders. That's the only way we, it will be like a driving force at a national level, where we are able to say, like, commercial corona, or abstain, jeu, nayako, it becomes a household name. 
we're able to say lung cancer. And when I was doing my own research, every four people you talk to, one has somebody close that have been affected by cancer. So it's something very close home. And therefore having united and unified communication and understanding how we're supposed to curate our messages in our various spaces for a different target audience is very key. Um, the next slide I have. Can I still be heard? We give examples, which is very important. Yes, we give examples, which is very important. Why? Obviously, we are very many stakeholders. But if we do understand the concept behind the who and the how, then we shall be able to um, disseminate the same information, so long as we have an overriding campaign. So here we just have examples of uh, scenarios. Let me see if you're on the same page. Yes, so persona one, um, we give an example of a 40-year-old who's a cancer champion, meaning uh, a survivor, uh, and a professional who prioritizes a healthy lifestyle. What is call to action? Call to action is what is it that you are telling the public, accompanying messages to the overall campaign, that you want them to be able to, you remember the uh, um, awareness, action, and eventually adapting to your messages. So the call to action here is for this specific age group um, and survivor, uh, how we'd like to key the message is, one is a testimonial on how to prevent because it's being talked to. Uh, the message is coming from, remember so social cognitive theory says, people are able to change their behavior through observing. Uh, testimonial on prevention. This is somebody talking about uh, a life experience that they've had and they're calling to action to the public. This is how you can prevent cancer. You know, uh, if it's about reducing smoking or et cetera, et cetera. Uh, infographic on the top five cancer prevention uh, tips. Those are just guidelines on how to, to package and curate cancer messaging. The second description of persona two is a concerned caregiver who is always seeking information on treatment options, emotional support, et cetera, et cetera. Call to action, same thing, testimonials sharing, sharing the personal experience and the importance of support groups. Uh, tips on self-care and managing stress while supporting loved ones. Uh, persona three, uh, a caring, uh, maybe a kid under 18 years uh, of age. Um, this is someone who's aware of cancer and may have encountered cancer-related situations, who is curious and compassionate and information seeking. Again, call to action, testimonial sharing, personal experience. You see how this keeps recurring, um, how the call to action and personal experience is very important. How else can we ensure we are disseminating our key messaging tips on self-care and managing stress while caring for the loved ones? This also applies to the concerned uh, caregivers. Um, another persona four, which is very important, I'll get to the national campaign and what we are really focusing on, uh, is say early screening, early middle-aged, aware of the importance of early detection and prioritizing his health and only six regular screening and medical checkups. Personal story, how early detection saved life. And as we move to the next slide, which is what I really want to stress on the national campaign, um, the first and most important uh, that the focus here is prevention, which is done through early detection. So um, if you notice the our commercial corona or our chukua chanjo or tumechil has focused a lot on prevention. Uh, because if you're able to come at that, at the prevention stage, we have been able to, we are, we are halfway through the journey. Um, so obviously the obvious thing is that we need to obviously align, uh, I know cancer again with the many cancers, it has a lot of, uh, color. We want to be able to, again, when it comes to brand, I like giving an example of Safaricom. Safaricom have done so well with their green. I hear there's something called green Safaricom, that if you see this specific green, 
you know it's for cervical. Uh, so anyway, for all cancers, the overriding is the purple. So then there's that bit of ensuring that there's consistency in, in the dominant brand color. Uh, next is, what is our campaign? Uh, we had had a stakeholder engagement and we came up with Zuia Cancer. Like I said, we are really focusing on uh, prevention at this stage. This just basically shows uh, execution of the campaign. Um, as you can see here, like what we were talking about, the different scenarios of the persona. We have the lady, did you know? You know, just to demystify, there's a lot of myths and misconceptions around cancer, what it really is, what causes it, how to prevent. Also, there's a lot of cultural, you know, influences and barriers. So this is just to ensure that we are constantly debunking the myths. Obviously, always around campaign, there's a lot of IEC materials, information education materials around it. Again, brand consistency, purple. And now the song we shall be singing like commercial corona. Uh, unified as stakeholders is uh, Zuiya Cancer. And that is what part of these dissemination workshops are for, to say, we now have a national campaign called Zuiya Cancer. This is um, our target audience. This is how we want to curate our message. And we want to be consistent and we want to speak the same language. The only difference maybe comes in the mediums that we use. The medium that you use for teenagers today is not the same medium that you use for the elderly. But we'll get to that in the strategies, which I think Helene will take us. So the overall goal, as we have said, I think in the previous uh, presentation, to provide a well-coordinated, and that's highlighted because of the coordination part. There are many, many stakeholders all doing great and beautiful things, but how coordinated are we? Are we speaking in the same language? Are we understanding our audience? Are we being able to tell them what we need to tell them? Are we understanding how? Uh, what we tell them will change their behaviors in the long run. And again, behavior change communication is not something that happens overnight. Again, I'll use HIV and AIDS because I think it's the one that has, has been with us for a long time in terms of um, behavior change campaigns. I think we started with serious behavior change campaigns in the early 2000s, late 90s. And it's until maybe a 10 year plus span, uh, you're able to see meaningful uh, behavior change, uh, uh, you know, condom use, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and again, uh, the strategies and communication keeps changing. You address one thing, then you realize, okay, now we need to talk about the other. We'll come and regroup and say, now let's address, we have done prevention well, let's address screening and detection and et cetera, et cetera. So the overall to provide a well-coordinated and sustainable national cancer communications framework that will enhance public awareness in cancer prevention and control to reduce Incidence, morbidity, and mortality for cancer while improving the quality of life for cancer patients in Kenya. So I'll just brush through the objectives. I believe, Elaine, you're picking up from here. So the first is establish an enabling policy environment for effective implementation of the National Cancer Communication Strategy. Um, increase public awareness promote behavior change. These are big one because that is where we go all out on all the kind of media. I remember um, my previous speaker talking about the Nyeri and um, um, using of the local language. That is for one target audience. Uh, the strategy is able to go down and break and show. So there is the people in Mashinani, for example. How about what do people in the, in the, in the city, Nairobi, Mombasa, Kisumu, does community radio station work anymore? Maybe not. Uh, is it webinars like this one? How frequently should we do them? What are we telling our audience? Is it TV? I don't know if people watch TV anymore. It depends on the target audience that you're targeting. Exactly. Et cetera, et cetera, sorry. Objective three, enhance stakeholder capacity to effectively communicate cancer awareness. It's part of what we are doing now to reduce stigma and increase uptake of cancer screening and treatment services across diverse population groups. And finally, we are not able to know how well we are doing if we don't have a, a monitoring evaluation framework to assess the impact of the communication strategy and public knowledge, very important. Attitudes, behaviors related to cancer prevention, detection, and treatment. So, Elaine, am I still going through the objectives or you're taking up from here? I can take up from here. Thank you very much, Celia. Okay, Karibu sana, Asante. Good evening all, so I'd like to take you through the communication strategy mix. 
So the next slide. Under the objectives, we have different strategies. So the first strategy is to strengthen coordination at all levels. So who's going to do this? The national government, county government, development partners, civil society, private sector, and, and cancer champions. So there are several themes and activities, but I'll take you to the desired outcome. So the desired outcome out out of this strategy is to create a harmonized cancer communication planning and implementation. The next slide. When we come to strategy, strategy two, which is to establish required policies and legislations to address uh, barriers, the people who will be involved in this is the county assembly, the MPs and community leaders. And the desired outcome here is to increase number of policies that support cancer prevention and control. For example, tobacco and alcohol laws in counties. Next slide. Strategy three is to have a standardized cancer communication, to have standardized cancer communication materials. Who's going to work on this? The ACSMTWG. So the desired outcome here would be enhanced credibility, trust, and public confidence in cancer-related information sharing through ACSM channels. Next slide, please. The objective number two, we have the first strategy is to collaborate the media for accurate and responsible reporting on cancer related topics. Who's gonna do this? There's a mainstream media, print and electronic, bloggers, communication agencies, and social media influencers. If you go to the next slide, we'll find the desired outcome, which are accurate and responsible reporting on cancer related topics, integrated cancer communication in media school curriculums and programs, and more people reached with cancer messaging messages through various channels. Next slide. The second strategy is to enhance interpersonal cha channels, patient client, peer-to-peer -peer support groups for cancer awareness. As we had said earlier, it's the source of the information that really matters. So who's going to be involved in this cancer patients? cancer champions, high-risk populations, caregivers, peer educators, and the general public. And we'll go to the next slide where we'll find out what are the desired outcomes. The desired outcomes would be increased number of people reached with cancer messages through peer-to-peer -peer and community outreach programs, empowered cancer champions serving as advocates, and positive behavior change. On the third strategy, we have to design and conduct tailored uh, cancer awareness initiatives for specific populations. Who are these populations? We're talking about teachers, workers, students, the vulnerable communities, uh, those ones in the conflict zones and refugee camps. And if you go to the next slide, we'll find the desired outcomes, which are improved awareness and behavior change for specific population groups, increased uptake of screening, reduce stigmatization of cancer disease. The, in objective three, the first strategy is to sensitize community health workers. These are very important uh, group of people that we need to work with. And we're talking about the CHPs. And the desired outcome here is to have improved cancer knowledge and communication skills, increased public awareness and uptake of cancer prevention services. Under objective three, we have strategy two, which is comprehensive training programs focusing on effective communication skills. Who are going to be key here? Uh, this is the healthcare providers. And if you go to the next slide, we'll find the, the outcomes. There are four outcomes. Improved healthcare providers' communication skills. Here we are targeting one by uh, 10,000 healthcare workers. Improved awareness among clients and patients. And the target here is that 70% of the general population are reached with cancer messages, increased demand for screening and prevention services, and downstaging of disease for better treatment of cancer. Elaine, probably you may check your internet. You're breaking. Yeah, check your internet. You are breaking. Three, we have strategy three. 
which is collaboration and NGOs and Elaine, we can't hear you, or is it me? Yeah, we have lost Elaine. Maybe Celia, you can take it up from there again. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, so we are at strategy three. Um, collaboration with, with non-governmental and uh, CBOs. Uh, again, who are these? You know, the advocacy groups, the ones who push the message on the ground, as we know. What is the key theme that we are telling these people? Remember, I'd mentioned, especially for cancer, because our target audience is very diverse. Uh, it's not like uh, I'd give an example of, hmm, let me see. Um, when it comes to health, it cuts across. Uh, but polio, for example, and if it is prevention, we're targeting mothers specifically. For cancer, we have different uh, layers of uh, our people that we're targeting. What are we specifically telling this group? Working together with stakeholders to achieve the goals of the NCCS, what activities we are conducting sensitization through community forums, we are leveraging on partner forums within the cancer space. What do we perceive to be our outcome? More partners adopting the cancer communication programs aligned to establish guidelines and standards. By the way, the enhancing of stakeholder capacity, we are all aligned to the strategy. We do this dissemination successfully and we are all speaking in the same voice. I bet we'd be doing much more and we'd be more impactful than even the HIV awareness. Objective three, uh, empower decision makers to raise the profile of cancer. Who are these county and community leaders? Community leaders include religious leaders. You know, the people we've count, we have voted for at county level. Uh, even at your homes, uh, there are leaders in there. What are our key themes? Advocate for policy change that promote affordable and equitable access. Activities around that is conducting sensitization through conferences and, and seminars, webinars like this one, which we have already started. This is going to be a continuous thing. We hope you continue coming to, to for these webinars and learning. It's very important. Develop and disseminate advocacy toolkits, conduct resource mobilization for cancer communication activities at county levels. What is our perceived outcome? Increase knowledge on risk factors and management. I know for healthcare workers, you're doing better than I am, for example. Integration of cancer prevention and control messages in all spheres. And a well-resourced cancer communication unit within the county. This will help what with specific messaging. If you're struggling around how do we uh, say message A to person X, They'll be able to help you curate the messaging. Like I said, messaging is, is everything. We have our overall campaign, but then it's cascaded to the different audiences, uh, depending on who you're speaking to. Objective four, set up a comprehensive m and &E framework. What's the first strategy? Uh, create mechanisms to track and impact communication initiatives. Who? The people here mostly were healthcare professionals. Our key themes is to say what is the importance of m &E. Activities track the impact of communication initiatives using the national reporting tool. Maybe Dr. Borg can expound on this. Develop a harmonized communication monitoring plan and reporting system for cancer communication activities across the country. I was also part of COVID comms and I remember we had a tracker and all stakeholders we used to meet. I know that time everything was emergency, emergency, emergency. And different people were doing different things in different spaces. There were those who were uh, doing the campaigns to the youth specifically through digital media. There were those who were doing to the community, through community radio stations. Uh, so then there's something called a media tracker where we are able to say, uh, we've been able to conduct X number of webinars. Uh, we managed to do X number of uh, say, uh, PSAs on radio, we've been able, able to, and that monitoring will be able to tell us, okay, fine, we've been able to go to these particular places, these places have a gap, but also this needs a lot of stakeholder coordination, which we hope will continue. 
as we have started. Development and validation of a communication reporting tool. Then objective four, uh, set up a, a still under setting up a comprehensive, sorry, MNE framework. Activities continued quarterly reporting by cancer communication stakeholders. Conduct quarterly can cancer communication review meetings. Again, what I was explaining. What have we managed to do in terms of the mediums that we've chosen to speak to the different audiences? Uh, what response are we getting from these audiences? Are people going for screening more? That's how we are able to tell. Uh, are people talking about cancer more? Are people more knowledgeable? You can have a before and after uh, questionnaire to see uh, before people's perceived level of cancer knowledge was this much and now we're here. Outcome enhanced tracking and measurement of reach, effectiveness and impact of communication activities. Uh, strategy two, gather and analyze data for cancer prevention and detection and treatment. Who is this? Mostly it's communication and m &E experts. Uh, the theme is data management for informed decision making. That data then now will be able to inform us where the gaps are, where, where we can do more, where we can do less. No more often than not, there's no doing less. It's doing more where there's less. Uh, what are the activities around that? Conduct and leverage on periodic county surveys. Uh, conduct fo focus group discussions and interviews. Uh, what are the outcomes? Data that we can use at county level and come back and sit as stakeholders and say, okay, fine. The level of cancer awareness is here. We need to do more in terms of uh, more, you know, more facilities to screen, for example. Is it medication that there's a gap? Is it knowledge? Do we need to produce more IEC materials? Uh, do we need to translate them to local language? Whatever it is, the data should be able to tell us. Uh, still on objective four, strategy three is utilize evaluation findings to improve future communication strategies, which is actually what I have uh, explained just now. Another still example, I'm sorry, I keep going back to HIV and AIDS. We had different campaigns at different levels, starting with prevention to condom use, you know, to even uh, if you are diagnosed and you're positive, ARV. So there have been different research again was done or data told us that the people who are spreading the virus at one time, I remember, were married couples. And that's how we came up with the Achana Nampangwa Kando campaign. Again, how successful that was or wasn't. I know that was turned around a bit and became Mpangwa Kando Lazima. Again, it's a continuous process where you keep analyzing your data and using that data to improve. But only when we get people talking, get people understanding, get people uh, consume the data in a way that influences their behavior, then we can say we're in the direct, we're in the right uh, direction. The outcome is obviously updated strategies, which will keep improving like that. Uh, explained objective four still. The last is gather feedback from all stakeholders, including yourself. Uh, continuous improvement, m and &E, I mentioned that. Activities and get stakeholders through the professional association, conferences and other forums like webinars. Outcome, a, cultures of, a culture of continuous improvement using m and &E findings. Um, Communication strategy matrix. This is another 20 something slides. Elaine, I don't know if this was supposed to be part of still your presentation. And how much time we have? It's 8.15. Can I proceed? Yeah, I think, Frila, you can go on with the crisis communication. Just so speak I jump about crisis. it briefly. Yeah, we can jump. Yeah. Yeah, yeah let's jump to crisis. Uh, the stakeholder mapping is pretty straightforward you can be able to, to read through that. And we've touched a bit on that in the previous. So um, strategic crisis communication. So in any communication strategy or event, there has to be an anticipated crisis. Uh, what would be the crisis scenario? Maybe you can write in the chat box. Sorry, I'm not very good at speaking to myself. I like to know that people are listening and then they are participating. What do you think would be an anticipated crisis in cancer? Our, our campaign, Zuiya Cancer, what would come as a crisis? Uh, the Chanampangwa Kando, I can give an example, it almost became one because Kenyans as we are turned it into a circus and, and said, you know, Mpangwa Kando Lazima. And we had to reconvene and say, okay, how, how do we, it's like the campaign has been turned around and it's encouraging. 
um, Pangua Candles. This is, is even an association of Pangua Candles. Can uh, share a slide? As you, if, as you put that anticipated, um, maybe people saying that there are many cancers in a specific region. Yeah, that could be it. Um, so basically, complacency, misinformation, adverse events, lack of confidence in health system can trigger communication crisis, uh, information, whether facts or rumors. I know we have a problem in this day and age of something called in information infodemic. Too much information and it's not sure which is a trusted source of information and which is not cancer case in a senior member of society. Uh, kind of can be a crisis. Um, a big one could be facts versus rumors and maybe being told by, remember we're supposed to use cancer champion and then we have a religious champion who uh, instead of spreading facts, that's to spread uh, analogy around misinformation and it causes mm -hmm. panic across uh, the citizens. So how do we prevent that? Or treatment machines breaking down in a major treatment center, yes. So how we do that, we have to develop a crisis plan tailored to the strategy, identify, which is what we are doing, potential crisis scenarios, and establish okay. response Thank strategies. You, Celia. I think you'll finish with this with this slide. So okay. that I want to present it because we are time bad. We are time bad. No yeah. problem at all. So just at, like I've said in summary, preparation of a potential crisis is very important. And the first thing is to think about possible scenarios, which is what we have discussed. What can be a possible scenario and how we address that? The second and most important thing during uh, designing of our preparedness and planning for crisis is that to ensure there's a team at national and county levels already established whether or not there's a crisis. It's like insurance. You don't know whether you're going to get sick or hit a car, but you get the insurance anyway. Who are, who are, are identified, they, they know their roles and they are well coordinated. So that if a potential crisis comes about, uh, they know is do we need to call quickly a press conference? If you go through the crisis communication strategy down there, it will give you steps on how there's a template and a guidance. But obviously each crisis may be unique to itself, but then there's what is guided in terms of um, what would you do if, for example, major machines break at a, you know the potential crisis given at the chat uh step one is for the team to assemble step two you have to always be ahead of the communication you have to always be the one giving the communication before the rumors start to spread if you don't have the facts and figures it is paramount still to say we are aware of this we are looking into it etc cetera, etc cetera. and then following the guideline based on the cancer communication strategy that is there in detail will really help you get ahead of uh, whatever crisis is there, because sometimes crisis can really lead to, and we're in the health space, even loss of life. So I'd encourage you to continue going through the, I don't know whether NCCP team and the stakeholders in charge of this are being able to share the soft copy of the uh, strategy to look into um, the two parts that we missed out, the mapping, where you fall in and how to be able to deal with a crisis. But in a nutshell, uh, because I've been asked to summarize, uh, that is how a crisis, strategic, sorry, crisis communication is, is carried out. So thank you very much for, your, for, for the time. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll stop there and I'll hand it back to our moderator, Nashukuru Sana. Thank you, Celia, and thank you, Elaine, for the presentation. Uh, quickly, we'll usher in our last presenter, Dr. David Murage, to take us through monitoring urbanization and uh, financing. Welcome, Dr. Murage. Thank you, Lillian. Um, I'll take us through the last presentation. I'll, I'll be quick and be short. Um, I'll take us through a brief overview of the monitoring and evaluation of the communication strategy and the financing of the national communication strategy. 
Uh, already monitoring and evaluation is the fourth objective of this pillar. And it's an important part of any project that uh, takes place. Mainly this monitoring and evaluation will track the progress of the achievements and also the objectives that uh, have been set out. And also to see the progress the different stakeholders have taken in implementation. And it will also be used to track and assess the long-term changes that have been done in the cancer prevention and control. Uh, mind you, the monitoring and evaluation is not done as a standalone for this uh, strategy. It will be done as part of the National Cancer Control Strategy Monitoring and Evaluation, uh, which is outlined in the Monitoring, Evaluation, Accountability and Learning Framework. And um, uh, for this, we'll be doing an annual evaluation every July uh, as part of that review of the National Cancer Control Strategy. Uh, the national and the county ACSM TWGs will also uh, undertake surveys to look at uh, different surveys at various points to evaluate the effectiveness of this strategy. Uh, there'll be a baseline survey that will be conducted uh, this year, and then a midterm evaluation that will be done in 2025-2026, and the end term evaluation in the financial year 2027-2028. Mainly the end term evaluation will be conducted to determine the impact, effectiveness, efficiency, and the relevance of the plan. Um, some of the key indicators that we track, um, and this is this is just a small list of the indicators that we, we are, will be tracking. There's also a comprehensive list that you can look through the complete document. And they include the proportion of the uh, population that is reached by this messaging. Also the awareness that is uh, uh, in the population about cancer. Uh, we'll also be looking at the number of key messages that will be developed and also disseminated through the various media platforms. Uh, we, we also track the IEC materials that will be developed. And um, we, we also have a community component that we are looking at how many community units have integrated cancer in their dialogue uh, days. And um, uh, we will be also looking at the number of counties that have um, uh, uh, strategic um, action plans that have communications in them. And uh, the last one would be to look at how many counties and uh, in the national and national government, whether they have annual work plan or if they are CADPs that include cancer activities. Um, the Last part was on costing. Uh, costing is also a crucial um, um, uh, part of any project. And I've seen uh, someone was looking at uh, this and had asked in the chat where where the funding would come from. Uh, first, the budget that was um, developed looked at the cost both at the national and the county levels and include activity-based and input-based uh, kind of costing. Where activity-based, it looked at the different activities that would be taken during this uh, period, and also the, the input-based uh, costing, which was looking at the various services, uh, the various inputs that would be done, uh, that would be acquired during this period. And uh, the costing was done for the next five financial years, which would be the duration of this um, uh, strategy. Um, the ultimate cost for this five year would be 1.6 billion. And um, the costed items are listed here, which include the above market line, which include the main media platform, which would be used to disseminate information like TV, radio, print and billboards. The below market line, that were costed include roadshows, branding of um, uh, walls, like uh, in the highways, and uh, also IEC materials, SMS, and uh, M Health uh, kind of sending messages. Uh, the other part would be the digital uh, marketing, which is now the digital space, which include blogs, using Google ads online influencers, in-app in, uh, in adverts that would be used to disseminate the information. 
There'll be stakeholder engagement, which would include conferences, workshop, advo advocacy guides, call, um, call centers that would be used to uh, send information and also surveys that would be conducted in the three, the three surveys I mentioned earlier. The funding source would uh, have very varied funding sources, which include the Ministry of Health, the county governments, the development partners, and um, the key stakeholders. And um, we have the NCD ICC, which is a technical working group that already supports the resource mobilization from the various teams and uh, stakeholders. And um, we have already mentioned these others, the, the mechanism that would address other the gaps that would exist would include the chronic disease fund um, uh, and other taxation that would uh, evolve from there. That is the sin tax, the alcohol uh, tax, that is uh, the cigarette taxes that are collected. Uh, we also have the county CADPs, the annual work plans from the counties um, to include cancer awareness. We have the uh, private companies that would also raise through CR CSRs and um, uh, funding from the development partners, also direct or indirect funding from NGOs, civil societies, philanthropies, or conditional grants. Um, thank you. And back to the moderator. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Murage, for taking us through that uh, shortly. Uh, because of time, I would want to thank everyone who has joined the call. I've checked through the questions. I've not seen much question. There was one question which Dr. Murage already answered on funding. Uh, the rest of the uh the the rest of the um uh, inputs or comments. Uh, I can read one question, which is if people could give presentation. I can just say that uh, we'll be doing dissemination in counties, and uh, when we come to your county, probably you'll get um you'll get the the a copy of this strategy, and also you can get a copy of the strategy, the full copy of the strategy, as a a as a a, a, a booklet and a book and you can have it and read it. So I say thank you so much for attending this webinar and um, I wish you a good evening. Thank you and bye. Bye-bye. Many thanks to our panelists, you did very well. Thank you, Nelson, for supporting us. Have a good evening, everybody, bye.